putting it. Okay, um, did that answer your questions on that particular type of problem? Let's see, let me, I think I unmuted everyone. People still hear me? Okay. Um, Cheryl, you mentioned question nine. Um, let me see, I'm gonna see which double check which one was that. Okay. Uh, nine. Okay, so that was the Was this the one you were asking about, Cheryl? Yeah, I was lost at how to solve it. Okay. Let me res let me just reset that. So this is similar to the previous question. The only difference is they're only giving you the reactants and they're asking you about the products. Okay, um, so let me st I'll start this out so you can kind of walk through the process and see how I got to the final answer. Um, Uh, no, wrong section. One second. Okay. Let's show you mean, Tony. We were saying you were in the wrong room. <laughs> Oh, they're all in the other room. Um, can you go and send them into the right room? Okay. Just tell yeah, just tell them what to click so they can get in. Um, I didn't realize that could happen. All right, so question nine again.
Okay, so this one, we want the complete ionic equation for this reaction. Um, so I'm going to... I'm going to just I'll write this out so you can see how it would you it would go and that will allow you to determine whether or not it's the reaction actually occurs, okay? So in this case, you want to pay attention to the solubility rules of the reactants and products. So I'm going to look at this substance and I and I notice I have in the first part I have a sodium ion and I have a phosphate ion. So for an ionic equation, you want to write them, the ions separately. Okay. So when it's dissolved, the ions are going to separate. So I will end up with three sets of NH4, and that's in solution. So I'll mark it as solution. And this has a charge of plus two. Okay. I'm sorry. No, uh, plus one. So uh, there we go. Okay. Then the second ion is also in solution. And that's a phosphate, okay? PO4. And I only have one of them, so I'm not going to add a subscript. And that one has a charge of 3 minus. And, and notice the charges are still balanced. I'm just writing them as separate ions because that's how, in an ionic equation, that's how they're going to look in solution. They're going to float around as separate ions for ionic equations. Now, the second substance is sodium. And I have two sets of sodium because it's an Na2. So I'll write 2Na and then I'll also write the charge. Okay. So remember, when they're floating as separate ions, we always indicate they have their charge when they're separate. When they're together in a full compound, we'll write it. We won't show the charge because they're together and they cancel each other out. So I'm going to write it just like that. And then for the sulfate, I only have one of them. So I'm going to put a plus SO4. And this one has a charge of 2 minus. And it's in solution again. Okay. So now for my products, they would really just, the ions would just switch places. So the NH4 would now combine with the other negative ion, the sulfate, and the phosphate would combine with the sodium. Now, this is where you want to look at the solubility rules in your book. Um, I know I, I pulled that up last week in the slides, and I'm going to actually go to that. Okay. Let me um, let me pull up the solubility rules.
Okay, hang on one second. Since pe okay, people came in, let me um just for now I'll um unmute you so you can. Okay. Yes, Tony. Um, they they were kind of unwilling. They were pretty sure that they were in the right place. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what else to tell them. I just left. Uh, most of them came over, but there was a group that that said that they were pretty sure they were in the right place. There was nothing else I could have done other than tell them. All right. Give me one second. I'm going to try to lure them over here myself. <laughs> All right. Don't go anywhere, anyone. Okay. Megan, you're in the I, I, I think you're in the wrong room. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. But the other room that says virtual class the first one is yeah yeah i see them now okay All right. I think there's only one person left in there, so I f hopefully uh, everyone will find their way in here. And I didn't realize there were two separate rooms to go in, so I will definitely make it uh, clear next time. Okay. Cool. So let me go back to that problem again. Hopefully. Okay, can you see the screen now? The problem? Okay, looks like you can. Okay, so using the solubility rules from the book, okay, you'll see that when sodium reacts and combines with the phosphate, it's still in solution. So it's still a separated ion. So it's actually going to look the same on both sides of the equation. So it would look like that. And when it combines with a phosphate, 
the phosphate is going to be separate as well, so it's going to just be listed the same way. And the same with the the second reaction, which is the ammonium, so the NH4 would combine with the sulfate ion. If it, so if I write this, NH4 with a plus one charge, and let me just, I'll go back and balance that. And show it with the other substance, so we have the sulfate. So we have SO4 and the sulfate still has a minus two charge and it's in solution. Okay. Now, sometimes when you're writing these complete ionic equations, one of the two components when they combine will be not soluble. And you're going to use the solubility table to determine that. Now, if you're looking up, you can actually Google solubility rules and pull that up or find the table in the book. And it'll show you that for specific positive and negative ions, it'll tell you when they are soluble and when they are not. So in this case, ammonium and sodium are virtually always going to be soluble in water. So both, so if that's the case, has anything changed in this reaction? Can I just go to see the answers? Correct. Yeah, Yvette, no. So, in this case is no. So, now this is, if, if you found out one of the substances was a solid, what you would do is show it as a solid. So, I would take one of these two reactants and since if let's say for example the sodium did combine with the phosphate and formed a solid substance so I would just write it as a single formula rather than as two separate ions so would, these two would combine as a solid and I still make sure I balance the charges and so sodium phosphate so this would would have been in a three PO4S if that reacted. And, the, and the, if, let's say, the other substance was in solution, it would still show up as separate ions. And then I would, then I do the final step as balancing the equation. However, in this case, that didn't happen. The ions on the reactant side and the product side are still in solution, so nothing changed. So after all that work, it's rather anticlimactic, for, but for this particular problem, there's no reaction. So what it would look at for is that. Okay. So I did do, I did a lot of that work out just to show you what you would do if a reaction did occur, and you do have to look at what the pause, what the ions are going to combine on the other side to see if they're if they're soluble or not. Now if you look at the ion for the for the ions when they combine with each other, you find out none of them are insoluble, then you can conclude no reaction took place and just mark it as NR. I'll post a couple of other similar problems, definitely ones that have a reaction taking place so you can see how they look. Okay, Megan, you're asking about 19. I'll pull that one up. And okay, let me let's go to 19. Okay, so this is okay. This is a balancing equation problem, and let me reset it so you can. Okay, so. 
want to balance the equation, and they always say if necessary, because, I mean, sometimes you might get an equation, you don't have to do anything. It's already balanced. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is look at each element one at a time and balance them. Now, in a reaction where you see two substances or two elements in two different locations on either the product or reactant side, I would always balance that last. So in this case, if you notice on the product side, I have oxygen in two locations. It's part of carbon dioxide and it's part of water. That you have a lot of different ways you can balance that. So I would it's going to depend on how you the other substances are when you balance them. So for a case like that, balance it last. Okay, Megan, can you hear me now? Oh, okay. So let me go back to that problem. Okay. All right, so I will go to, so I'm going to start with the carbon. Okay, so I have three carbons on one side and one on the other side. So I'm just going to put a three to balance it. And on the hydrogens, I have three, six on one side and two on the other. So I'm going to put a three here so those sets of hydrogens are balanced. Okay, so now the only thing that's left is my oxygen. So here I have six oxygens on one side for in the carbon dioxide and then another three in the oxygen. So that means I would have nine halves to balance it. Now, that does balance the equation technically and if you're talking moles, it would make sense. But we also want the equation to make sense we're talking about individual molecules. So when you balance equations, you want to end up with whole numbers. So in a case where you can use a you can use a fraction to as a temporary placeholder, and then I'm just going to get multiply everything by two to turn that nine halves, which would be here, okay, into I'll just stick a nine, but remember that's nine halves. So now, I'm going to multiply everything by 2 to balance it. So that becomes a 2. This is really 9 halves times 2 becomes the 9. This becomes a 6. And this becomes a 6. So now let's just take a look. And if I... I still I have six and six carbons on the left and on the right. I have two times six, 12 hydrogens on the left. Six times two is 12 hydrogens on the right. And now I look at my oxygens. Okay, I have nine times two is 18 for, for that side. And then six times O2 is 12 plus six times one. So 12 plus six. 6 is 18 again. So this is my balanced equation. So I think I showed a problem like this last week as well where if you're in a you kind of paint yourself in a corner and you can only balance it by using a fraction put the fraction in there and then just multiply it out. And as long as it as long as it's balanced with the fraction if you multiply it out it will be balanced without the fraction. That's when that's what happens here. So let me just, if I submit it just to verify, and it should show it up as correct. Okay. So.
So, um, did that answer your question for that particular problem? Okay, let me go back. I saw one comment. Okay, go over the step where I put nine in again. Okay, let me just go back and re-explain that step. Okay, so in this case, before I put the nine in, Okay, I had one. This was a nine. This was actually a nine halves. This was a three, and that was a three. Okay. So at this point, now remember, I can't. I can't this interface doesn't allow me to put a fraction in here, but I'm just so you got to think of this nine o two is really nine halves o two. So my carbon's a balance, so I have three and three on each side. My hydrogen's a balance because I have six on one side, six on the left. My oxygen's a balance because I have three times two oxygens in the CO2, so that's six. And then three times one is another three, so that equals nine. And then if I have nine halves, oxygens times two is nine. So right now, with the nine halves, this is a balanced equation. But we don't want to balance it with fractions. So to do that, I would get rid of the fraction. So that means that nine halves would be multiplied by two to make it a nine. And if I, now since this is a ratio, whatever I do to one part, I have to do to all the other parts of the equation. So I'm going to multiply this one by two to make it a two. I already said the nine halves is multiplied by two to make it a nine. This gets multiplied by two to make it a six, and this gets multiplied two to get it make it a six. So now it's balanced with whole numbers. Okay, and that's the final equation. All right, let me go back and see if there's any more questions. Okay, so let's see. I had. Someone asking about eight, and I think there was one before that. I see 19 and, okay, number seven. Okay, I think I see seven first. I'll try to get to these all tonight before we start the lecture. Okay, seven. Okay, so this is just another this is just another example of writing a balanced equation. So, write a balanced equation based on the following: solid sodium reacts with solid iodine to form chromium iodide. So, chromium is just a metal. Most pretty much whenever you have a metal that's by itself the formula for the metal can just be written as a single atom and I'm just so I just have chromium and it's solid so let me reset this just so I'll show you the whole process so chromium and it's a solid and iodine like all halogens when it's by itself it's diatomic so iodine just like any other element in that with those seven electrons, it's going to be written diatomically, so I'm going to write it like that. And there's a lot of other substances that are diatomic, you know, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, chromine, bromine, iodine. Um, I mean, you can always look these things up. So, and iodine is solid, so I'm going to write it with an S after it again. Now I'm going to look at my products. Now in this case, I don't have to worry about figuring out the products because they're telling me what it is. It's chromium-3 
iodide. So this is a chromium ion with a plus 3 charge, and it's combining with iodine ion, which, if you look on your periodic table, because it's in group 7, we know group 7 has a minus 1 charge. So we have something with a plus 3 and a minus 1. Now, if I balance the charges, that means I only need one chromium ion, and which has a plus 3, and then I need three iodine ions, which have a minus, each of them have a minus 1 charge. And this is, again, a solid, so I'm going to write it with a solid. So I have my reactants and I have my products. Now I just have to go through and balance the equation. So if I have, my chromiums are balanced to start, to start with, but I have three and two of the iodines, so I'm going to just multiply this by two to make, so I have six iodides here, and then the iodine side, I'm going to multiply that by three to give that six. Now when I do that, I change my chromium so they're out of balance, so I'm just going to fix that by putting a two here. And that's my uh, final product and my final balance equation. Okay, so that's that's the final result for that. Okay, um, let me go back to the, see if there's anyone else. I see seven and, okay, Yvette is eight. Okay. Um, Megan, if you're still not hearing me, um, try the phone, try logging in, no, no, I don't know why I'm talking, because you can't hear me. Okay, you dialed in, good. Yeah, I don't, you know, you have to, <laughs> yep. All right, let's see, let me go back. So I see um, number seven. Okay. I made everyone presenters, so what that means is you should, if you have a question, um, you can just unmute your mic and you should be able to be able to talk. Um, but only don't keep it on all the time, just because it gets kind of loud and you get some feedback. So okay, now I'm asked, someone asked about question eight. All right, let me see. Did we look at eight yet? Okay. No. Okay. Eight. We already did. Um, so this just this is the final solution. So if you missed it, um, I, sh I believe I record. I it should be on the recording for the lecture. All right. Um, any other question? Any other problems from the homework? Okay, so you can either type it in or what which question you anyone else you want me to review? Ten. Okay. Let's see ten. Okay, th okay, this is another type of problem. Let me reset this. This is a neutralization reaction. So a neutralization reaction is very much like a double replacement reaction. Okay, you're still gonna you're gonna still have a case with a positive and negative ion switch places. The only case with a neutralization reaction, what you'll see is you have an acid and base combining and want so the acid produces H plus ions in water, and the base will produce hydroxide or OH minus ions in water. So when they combine, you just get a water molecule. So 
the way you solve it's going to be very similar to how you do a, a double replacement reaction. But because it's wa water it's forming rather than two sets of ions, we don't call it double replacement, we call it neutralization reaction. So if you see here, the sodium and the chlorine are going to combine because sodium is positive and chlorine is negative. And that's, so we know it's sodium chloride's table salt. We know table salt soluble. But if you didn't, you could look it up on the table, on the solubility rule table. And then our second product is just the hydrogen ion combining with OH hydroxide. H and OH <laughs> produces H2O. So we're just going to write that as water. Um, some books you might see it written as HOH, which is, is nothing wrong with that. It's just another way of expressing it. Um, so then that is the equation. It looks like everything is balanced. Let's see if it, I was right. There it is. OK, so that was 10. I do hear a lot of people. 10 and 11. Yeah, but if, you, if there's a question on the optionals too, um, I want to I want to get to the lecture sometime, okay, so we don't go too late. Um, but yeah, I, if there's questions on some of the optionals, we'll we'll look at those too. Um, let me, or I can even, we can even do another session later in the week if, if we don't get through them all tonight. Um, okay, 11. Let me look at 11. Okay, 11 was... Okay. Fortunately, the two one the two ones I, for net ionic equations were both NRs. But so in this particular case, you're looking at the positive and negative ions and their charges. So we have silver acetate. Okay, C2H3O2. So. If you look on your ionic table, the C2H3O2, even though it's a very complicated polyatomic ion, it only has a charge of minus one. And the silver has a charge of plus one, so that's ion compound. And then the Ni and the chlorate, the, so the ClO4 is a is a also a charge of minus one, that's, I'm sorry, I should have said perchlorate, ClO4 is perchlorate, and the nickel is plus two. Now, if you look at the solubility rules, you'll see that when the acetate combines with the nickel, it dissolves in water, and when the silver combines with the chlorate, it's also soluble in water. So in this case, you're starting with ions that are soluble in water, and when you mix them together, you still have sets of ions that are soluble in water. So nothing has changed on this either side of the equation. So in this particular problem, there is no reaction. Okay. I will make a point to find some react problems that do have results so you can see them. But there, I know there's a couple in the book. I, I It was just a bad guess on my part to, for the two problems I picked. For, I, they both happen to be NRs, which, I mean, is good, but you want to you want to also be able to look at cases where they do have a reaction. So that that's a correct answer for this one. It's just NR because ne none of them, the ion. When I switch the ions with each other, and look at the po potential products, they're still soluble in water. All right, so let me go back. Um, Okay, any others? Any other problems? Okay, it looks like I don't see anyone. All right, so let me, all right, why don't we, so 
let me start the the new material for tonight. If if you find out you want um, there's still problems you want me to go over, let me know. I'll we can set up a a session next week or just later in the week for that. Um, okay, I'm I'll be home so. Okay. Now, also, just to go back to the syllabus. Okay. So you see on our schedule, um, I do, we have a test scheduled for the 14th. So what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to give the test through the Chem 101 interface. What I'll do for next week is I'll just make that a review session. So you can come in, ask questions, and that night I will turn I'll post a test you don't have to take it that night you can take it any time during the week I'll just I'll set up a due date for the test to be done before the next class um, if so with the test you do have to I'll, I'll break it up into two sections but with the test you do have to complete each section of the test by um, in one session. So I'll, what I'll do is um, I'll break it up into two parts. I'll do one section which will be similar to what I we did normally with the in class session, which I'll put more of the multiple choice style questions on there, and then the second part will be more of the in depth problems. So I'll break it up into two parts, so you don't have to do the entire test in one sitting, and um, so they'll it'll appear in the exam now for the second so i'll do part one and part two for part two i'm going to see if i can make the exam the part two section of the exam untimed just like the homework is if i if i can't do that i'll have to put part two of the exam under the homework session. So it'll be just under the homework tab. It'll be labeled exam part two and you'll be able to do it. But um, so just I'll send out a little email to let you know where you can find parts one and part two of the exam so you're able to get to it. But just be aware um, if you don't see both parts under the exam test, just check the homework tab on the Chem 101 and you see if you can see it there. But um, I will post that next week um, I'll definitely I'll start posting some more practice problems so you can help you review for it um, and then next week I'll just make it a, a review session so I won't, I won't present any new material next week I'll just cover so be able to re, you'll be able to review questions and, and I'll answer questions on stuff we covered this week and then um, I'll just post the exams that night and then you can start them whenever you want on your own and do it for the week. Um, for practice tests, I'll just post um, problems in the practice sessions. So, so all the problems I'm going to post in the little pr optional practice sessions will be very similar to what you have on the exam. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go to the new material. So I'm going to share. Let me open up the slides. I don't want to do that. I want to go to the other slides. Okay, so let me post.
Okay, hopefully everyone can see the slide. It might take a second. I'll give it I'll give it a second for it to load on your screens. Um, okay, so everyone see the the uh, chemical quantity slide? Okay, good. All right, so tonight we're going to start looking at mole relationships in balanced equations. So this will allow us to give a quantity of a reactant and determine how much of a product we're going to get from this. So this is another example where the dimensional analysis is going to be heavily used. But in terms of new material, it many a lot of it is going to piggyback on what we covered two lectures ago when we're converting grams to moles and moles to grams. Okay, so it's not a whole lot of new stuff, but we're just gathering stuff we've already learned and using it to apply to whole equations. So let's start out with, okay, so again, just obviously we're still going to keep falling back to significant figures, writing conversion factors and using conversion factors and a little bit of uh, looking at percentages. Okay, so just a review on this point. Law of conservation of mass says that in any ordinary chemical reaction, atoms are not created nor destroyed, and matter is not created nor destroyed. So the total mass of the reactants is going to equal the total mass of the products in a reaction. So. Here's a textbook example of a theoretical model. Even though they're showing actual compounds, we're going to have a theoretical model. So I have two moles of silver. And you can see on the scale, the two moles of silver weighs 215.8 grams. I have one mole of sulfur, which weighs 32.07 grams. And when they react, I get a um, silver sulfide product, which weighs 247.9 grams. So the total mass of my reactants and products is equal. Now, in practice, this is actually impossible to happen because when you do a reaction, you cannot guarantee every single atom of all your products, reactants is going to react and form a product. And then when you try to measure it, there might be, there's always matter loss. So in practice, you'll always find that the mass of the, re, there's always matter loss. You're always going to lose something. And so you, the amount of your product is always going to be less than what you started with, just because not everything reacts. Um, some of it's lost. So you never will get a hundred, it's, 100% yield like this. But um, this is just a theoretical model, okay, just to show you what the law of conservation of mass happens. Okay. So when we have a balanced equation, there's many different ways we can interpret it. Okay, so we look at the original equation. We have two atoms of silver combined with one sulfur atom to form one unit of silver sulfide. And hang on one second, looks like my battery is dead, so I gotta check my, make sure I'm plugged in. Hang on one second. Let's see if that works. Okay. This is actually not in the book. It, it is on the slides I posted. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to die on you. All right. So, 
So we can also interpret this as a certain number of atoms. So I could have 200 silver atoms and 100 sulfur atoms combined to form 100 units of Ag2S. I can also think of this in terms of moles. Now, a mole is just a set of approximately 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd items. Okay, remember, a mole is just a number that we've approximated to be about 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So I can also interpret this as two moles of silver plus one mole of sulfur yields one mole of silver sulfide. So when I look at an equation, I can interpret it in, in terms of individual atoms and molecules, or I can interpret it as moles of atoms and molecules. And the advantage is when, we're doing, when we interpret it in terms of moles, now we're dealing with quantities that we can actually measure. Because individual atoms are too small to measure, but when, moles is such a large number that we can actually measure the mass of moles and work with, it's a large enough quantity that we can work with in a lab. So now, if I have two moles of silver and one mole of sulfur, that means I have 215.8 grams of silver and 32.1 grams of sulfur, and that yields me one mole of a product, which would have a mass of 247.9 grams. Okay, so in theory, again, the mass of my reactants is equal to the mass of my products. Okay, questions on this? Okay, I don't see any. So just remember, with a balanced equation, we can interpret it in terms of individual atoms and molecules and formula units, or we can interpret it in terms of moles. It, it's, just, it's a dual meaning. Just like on the periodic table, when you can look at the atomic masses, you can think of them as masses, the average mass of single atoms, or the mass of a mole of that particular element. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. So, when I have a balanced equation, I can look at the ratio of any two sets of reactants or products. So if I, if I look at this equation, I can make many different sets of ratios. And the reason we want to work with these ratios is because now we can use them in dimensional analysis when we're solving problems. So I, look at, I can look at the ratio of iron to sulfur in the reactant side. I can see there's two moles of iron for every three moles of sulfur. So I can make a ratio of two moles of iron over three moles of sulfur, I could flip it, okay, depending on which ratio I need. I can make a ratio of the iron to the, the product, the iron sulfide, iron three sulfide. So I could say two moles of iron for every one mole of Fe2S3, or again, I can flip it over. And then I can also make a ratio of sulfur to iron sulfide, iron three sulfide. So three moles of S over one mole of Fe2S3, or again, I can flip it. So any one of these balanced equations, I can make a ratio of any one reactant to a reactant or a reactant to a product, or if there's multiple products, I can make ratios of products to products. Okay. So, um, Okay, so just look at this example, and um, I'll, I'll let you, you can, so we have um, 3H2 plus N2 yields 2NH3. So which one, which for A, which, which one displays a correct mole factor for hydrogen and nitrogen? So you have the one, two, or three. All right.
2 is correct. Okay. So if you see here, 1 mole of N2, okay, com with 3 moles of H2. Now that's not the only ratio I can make, but of the three listed, that's the only one that's correct. Okay, so then for B, a mole factor of, for NH3 and H2, it would be what? Two, that's right, Caitlin. Okay, again, two. Two moles of NH3 to three moles of H2. So notice when we're making these formulas, we're ma it's always, we're using the coefficient from the balance equation and then the formula that that coefficient is in front of. Okay. Don't, when you're doing mole-mole ratios, don't look at the ratios of individual atoms, but look at, you all, you're usually going to make it as, use the coefficient and with the formula for what part of that equation you're representing. All right, so those were correct. So when I, we want to calculate the quantities of reactants and products in a reaction. This is kind of an algorithm that we're going to use. We're going to look at, we start with, what again, what we're given in addition to the balance equation and what we're trying to figure out. And then just like we were doing before with our other dimensional analysis problems, we're going to come up with a plan to see step by step how I can convert my rea what I'm starting with to what I'm trying to figure out. And in that process, if I have to convert one substance into another, I'm going to use the mole-mole factors to create a conversion factor for that. And I set up the problem and I do the conversion. Okay, so here's an example. How many moles of iron are needed for the reaction of 12 moles of O2? Okay, so what that means is if I have 12 moles of O2 going into this reaction, how many moles of iron are going to be needed to combine with it? So, in this case, we look at what we're given. We're given 12 moles of O2, and what we're trying to figure out is how many moles of iron are going to combine with it. So, we set this up, okay? So we're going to, we're starting with moles of O2, and we're going to, we can convert it in one step to moles of iron. And we can just going to use a mole-mole ratio from this balanced equation to do that. So I set, so I'm going to write out my, use the coefficients to make my mole-mole relationship. So in this case, I, I'm trying to figure out the relationship between iron and O2, so I'm going to use the relationship of three moles of O2 for every four moles of iron. Now I don't write, I haven't set this up yet, so I don't know which way it needs to be flipped if it's three over four or four over three. But I, as long as I know I have one, I know I might potentially have to flip it. So now. I set up my equation. So I start with the 12 moles of O2. Okay, that's what I'm given. And I'm going to put up in a conversion factor. Now, since I want the moles of O2 to cancel out, I'm going to put that part on the bottom and the moles of iron on the top. Okay, notice the 4 and a 3 match the coefficients that are in the equation. So I have 4 moles of iron for every 3 moles of O2. The moles of iron, I'm sorry, the moles of O2 cancel out. And so I have 12 times 4 over 3, which equals 16 moles of iron. Now, in terms of my significant figures, we're going to assume the 12.0 moles is a measured value. Okay, so that has three significant figures. The ratio in the balanced equation are exact numbers. 
So this a ratio of exact numbers is an exact ratio. So we think of that as having an infinite number of significant figures. So I don't, I don't deal with significant figures in that second part. So then my result is only going to have three significant figures. So I write that as 16.0. I need the point zero to in, to write it as showing I have three significant figures in that result. OK. Um, if you have questions, you can just hit the raise hand quest button if you have any questions at this point. I'll give you a second. OK, let's go on to the next slide. OK, so another similar problem. How many moles? OK, Megan, thank you. How did I reach three to four moles? So again, this is the mole mole factor from the balanced equation. OK, I, I know I have, I'm trying to find a relationship between O2 and iron. Now, if I look at the balanced equation, I, you see the three in front of the O2 and the four in front of the iron. So that's where I use those, that, those sets to get the ratio. So four irons over three moles of O2. And so I, I put that in my in conversion factor. And I, I need the O2 on the bottom, so it can, cancels out the 12 moles of O2 on what I'm starting with. And that allows me to figure out the product. OK. So the, that was that step where I used to write the mole mole factors. Did that answer your question? Why only the first half of the equation? OK. Let me, if you see here, I have 12 moles of oxygen. OK, I'm trying to figure out how many moles of iron I need to combine with that. And from this equation, I can see for every three moles of O2, I need four moles of iron. OK, three O2, four iron. So when I'm setting up the mole mole factors, OK, I can write, I write it as a ratio, 3 moles of O2, which matches the 3 O2 I have in that top equation, over 4 moles of Fe, which match the 4 Fe in the equation. So does everyone see where that came from? OK, Carmen. Tony, you see where I got that? Because I know you said you were lost. OK. Still no. OK. OK, see the 3 mole O2 here, Megan, in the bottom, in that fraction? OK. Um, can you hear us? Yes, Megan, you can talk. One second. My audio keeps wanting to shut off and on. All right, so I, I don't I'm focusing on the first half of the equation. I guess I just don't understand why we have all these the second set of information to look at on here after the arrow. I know some people might get it. I just I just am not really getting the equations in general. This is confusing. Okay. So you understand the you you can you make sense out of just the balance equation? The four Fe S plus three O two yields two Fe two O three? Does that make sense? No. No, because okay. the balancing equations in general is confusing. like 
I'm sure what I'm going to probably have to do with you is I'm probably going to have to set up a day to, like, sit and talk over it with you so you don't have to start from the square one again. I just – I can get why reactions react the way they do. And it, like, when you – when back on the homework when we were doing the first couple questions, it's just when it comes to the equations in general. That is just throwing me for a whole nother loop. Okay. And so you're... making it sound just not understanding this, so – that's kind of where I'm currently All right, at. so I would definitely suggest review balancing the equations because if you don't know yeah. how to balance the equations, you're going to be lost on this part. I, I, I understand okay. that. So uh, let me try to just try to catch you up a little bit. I'll, and then What I'm going to probably – well, I was there for the last class. I just don't – I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just – get. I'm going to – I'll email you later on a day where we can just sit down and talk about it if possible. That's fine. Whenever you're available to do so. And okay. we'll just do like a three session because – I know I went through the last class with you. It's just, it's a little different trying to learn this for me at least over the computer than it is in person. I Yeah, so. I understand. Um, I would suggest, I did post a few more practice problems on balancing equations and I would even try YouTube. Just see if you can, I did. you did do that. I, okay. did. I did do that for the homework. So that's why I'm saying I'll probably just, I'll email you and I'll give you We'll go over whatever dates work for you and okay. whatever works for us. And if it's possible, if I could set up a, like a study day, just so I That's can fine. figure out what I'm, it, it, like I said, it helps. This is harder for me to learn on the computer than it is for me to learn in person. I am, so. Yeah. And it's, it's same right. for teaching it too. So don't worry. About it. Fair enough. Okay. All right. I will let you guys continue. I get off the audio. Sorry guys. Okay. So let me go back. Okay, Tony, step one and two. Okay, so this case, they've already given you a balanced equation. So reason it's balanced, okay, if you see, I have a four in front of the Fe, so that means I have four iron atoms. And on the product side, it's two Fe2O3. So if I multiply the big two, which we call the coefficient, times that little two after the iron, that's the subscript, the two times two is four. That tells me how many iron atoms I have. And so it's four on the right and four on the left. And for the oxygen, I have three sets of O2. So that means I have six oxygen atoms on the right and on the left. So I have a balanced equation. So I create a mole-mole factor, okay? I first want to look at what I'm given. And so I'm given 12 moles of O2. Okay, it's telling me this is what you start with. I'm at, and then what is it asking for? How many moles of iron are going to react with the 12 moles of O2? So I know I'm, I look at the, what, the, what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with a, a ratio of iron to O2 for this reaction. So I'm going to create a mole-mole factor based on only those two components. So I'm going to make a ratio from the 4 Fe to 3O2. Now, we can, I said we can interpret that as 4 moles of Fe plus 3 moles of O2. So that's why I'm, I'm going to write it that way when I create a mole-mole equation. So that's what I have here. So in step three, I have on the uh, right side, I have four moles of Fe over three moles of O2. Now they just happen to write both versions of the ratio. They flipped it over. And you can also think of it three moles of O2 over four moles of F Fe. It's just a ratio based upon the information in the equation. Now, it's not asking about the Fe2O3 part, so I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just looking at the, for this particular equation, I'm just looking at the relationship between the iron and the O2 in the reactant side. So then, I'm going to use that relationship as a conversion to convert O2 into Fe. All right, so I have moles of O2, and I want to figure out how many moles of Fe it will react with. So I use that ratio now. 
four moles of Fe. Again, it matches the four Fe in my balanced equation that I was given over the three moles of O2, which is the three corresponds to the three O2 in the equation. Okay. So then I just multiply it out. You see the O2s cancel out. And so I have 12 times 4 over 3, which is 16, and I get my product. I'm sorry, I get my of a result, I should say, which is the moles of Fe. So with this problem, I was given the balance equation and the 12 moles of O2 as part of the question. And it was just asking how many moles of Fe I can get from the O2. All right. Does that clear things up for people? Is it at least a little easier to understand? Another comment. The, the 12. What about the 12? Well, the 12 was given in the problem. That's part of the question. You, that wasn't figured out. You were given the 12 moles of O2 and the balanced equation. Right. So we'll... Can I use any... Any what? Any number. Well, you want to use, well, you could, I mean, you could use any number in practice if you're making a practice problem for yourself, but in this, the, the, you want to use the one that they're giving you in the problem so you can get the right answer. If I change 12.2 to a different answer, I'm going to get a different result, obviously. I, I mean, I could, if I use like two moles of O2 that I'm starting with, I, I could solve it and I would get um, eight thirds, which would be like a little more than two point something for my result. Um, but the, you, the, you just want to make, you're just looking at what the problem's giving you, and then you're taking from what they're given, figuring out what the result would be for that particular case. Okay. Okay, here's another problem. Very similar to the first one. How many moles of NO2 can be produced when three moles of O2 react? So in this case, they're asking if three moles of O2 go into the reaction, how many moles of NO2 are going to be produced? Now this one is looking at how much it's asking about a product based upon a reactant. But I'm going to still solve it the same way. All right. So I have my balanced equation. The NO2, the 2O2 yields 2NO2. This is what I'm. This is part of the information that you're given in the problem. You're not, you know, in this case, you're not figuring it out. Okay, they give that to you. So, and on a test, I'm not gonna. I'll give you. I'll if there's pro, questions we have to predict the product or something or balance an equation, I'm going to put that separate from these problems. So I'm, I'm not going to throw everything in one single problem because I want to see wh where, you, where you're all having trouble with it. So I'm not going to put it, jam everything into a single question. So you're going to be given a balanced equation. So now it's asking, again, you're given three moles of O2. What are we trying to figure out? Well, in this case, we're trying to figure out how many moles of NO2 we're given. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to click that. Given the three moles of O2. Okay, so we're going to look at the, that relationship, the relationship between O2 and NO2. Now, if I look at this reaction, if I have two moles of O2, how many moles of NO2 will I have? Two is correct. Okay. We notice here it says two O2 
yields 2NO2. So for every two moles going in of O2, I get two moles of O2 coming out. Now, you could also simplify and think of it as a one-to-one -one relationship. But So in this case, I'm, gonna, I'm starting with moles of O2, and I'm going to convert it into moles of NO2. Again, it's just a one-step process for this problem. So I write out my mole-mole factor using the coefficients. Now, I don't, you don't need to write out every single mole-mole factor from the equation. You just have to get the one you need. So in this case, I have O2. I'm trying to figure out NO2. So I just look at the relationship between those two formulas. I don't, I'm not worrying about the NO2, the N2. I'm, it's not asking about that. It's just looking at the relationship between O2 and NO2. So if I see this, it says 2O2, which means I have 2 moles of O2 per 2 moles of NO2. So I have this formula, and from that I can derive a, a ratio of 2 moles of O2 over 2 moles of NO2. And again, I can flip it. Now, there's a whole bunch of other relationships I can get from this equation, but I, I don't need them. I just need the relationship of O2 to NO2 in order to solve this problem. So, now I set up my equation. So, I always start with what I'm given. In this case, I'm given 3 moles of O2. So, I start there. I set up a conversion factor using the mole-mole relationship. In this case, I want the moles of O2 on the bottom and the moles of NO2 on top because I want it to be able to cancel out. So I have 3.0 moles of O2 times 2 moles of NO2 over 2 moles of O2. Again, that corresponds to the coefficients in my balanced equation. It's a 2 to 2 ratio. And so... I multiply it out, I end up with 3.0 moles of NO2, which makes sense. I mean, if I look at the equation again, for every mole that goes in of O2, I get the same number of moles coming out. So it's a one, it's a two to two, a one to one relationship. So it makes sense. If I have three moles of O2 going in, I should have two, three moles of NO2 coming out. Okay. Is this uh, starting to make more sense for people? Yes. Thank you. Yes. And good. Tony? Still no, okay. Um, yeah, if you want, if you want to email, if people are still lost, um, definitely email me. Um, I'm available most evenings during the week, so we can definitely, if you want to let me know when you're available during the week, we can set up a, another session. We'll do it, just do it in the regular room um, and review that. And if and if this, and I'll we'll even record that session. And I'll post it if you, if, you, if people need extra help. In the meantime, I would suggest just look look on YouTube. Try to look for stoichiometry problems. Um, review the pra the homework is going to give you a little bit of extra help. It, I put some problems again with the drag and drop interface, so you can actually practice setting up the equations. I'll pull in some more additional problems because it seems you, some people that need it. I'll put that in the, the uh, practice section. Um, so see if you can try to figure those out. This is not easy stuff. It, I don't expect you to, I don't expect everyone to get it just the first time. You're going to have to take a break from it, come back to it, um, and look at it a few more times. I mean, this is not something you, you're just going to get right away. But from this lecture, these last few slides is really the only new stuff 
from tonight. So if you understand this, you un you'll understand most of the new stuff from this particular lecture. Most of the other stuff is just going to be review, and we're just combining it in different ways to show, uh, solve different set types of problems. But this this is this part's the only really new thing we're covering tonight. Okay, so now we're going to look at the same type of problems, but now instead of giving moles, we're going to look at giving our amounts in grams and figuring out grams of a product or from grams of a reactant. Okay. Now we already know how to convert grams to moles using molar masses. So we're really just going to take what we've just learned from the previous section and combine the conversions of grams to moles and moles to grams. So here's a kind of a template for these types of problems. Okay, so you're going to be given the mass of substance A and it converted to the mass of a second substance B in the reaction. So we're going to need three different things. We're going to need the molar mass of whatever A is, because that's going to allow us to convert grams to moles for A. We're going to need the molar mass of B at the end, because that will allow us to convert the moles of B into grams of B. And then in the middle, that middle part, between the, mol, the conversion of moles to A to moles of B, to B is just what we have just did in the previous section. Okay, we're using the mole-mole ratio to convert moles of substance A to moles of substance B. So we're just combining this into a single problem. And that will allow us to start with the mass of one substance and convert it to the mass of another substance. So here's an example. Okay. Now, it's, a lot of times when you look at these problems, it's a little bit of the challenge is just trying to decipher the meaning from the, the problem itself, but they're really all going to be solved as dimensional analysis problems. So in this case, we, we're given a balanced equation. Okay, where we have a ethane, C2H2, we're burning it, it's combining with oxygen, and we're getting carbon dioxide and water as products. The equation is balanced. Um, now, when you're doing the homework problems, make sure the equation is balanced. I know there are very, a lot of teachers love to give you unbalanced equations, and you start solving it, and you're halfway through the problem, and you realize you forgot to balance it. Okay. Always check to make sure the equation is balanced. Now, in this case, it is balanced. So, what do we in this, Okay, so in this problem, we give it, in addition to the balanced equation, what are, what are we given? Right. We're given grams of C2H2, which is actually our reactant. Okay. In some cases, it might give you a product and ask how much of a reactant you need. In this, in this case, we're given a reactant. It's asking us how much of a product we can get. So we're given 54.6 grams of C2H2. It's asking us to find out how many grams of CO2 we need. So now, we want to write out our plan. So our plan is very similar to what I just talked about in that first slide. We start with the grams of our substance, OK, grams of C2H2. We're going to change that into moles of C2H2, OK? All these cases, you always want to get to moles because moles tells you how many molecules or atoms or formula units you have. Okay, we can't, grams by itself doesn't tell me us how many atoms we have. Moles is 
the actual number of atoms we have. So if we're ever in grams, we have to know how many atoms we're dealing with. And that's what the mole, the gram to mole conversion does. Okay, so we take the grams, we convert it to moles. Then once we're in moles, we can use the, re the ratio from our balanced equation to go from moles of one substance to moles of another substance. So in this case, I, for my balanced equation, I can see I have two C2H2s, or two moles of C2H2, and when that goes into the reaction, it will produce four moles of CO2. Okay, there's a relationship of two C2H2 to four CO2. So I use, I'm gonna use that mole-mole relationship. And then once I know how many moles of CO2, I just use the molar mass of CO2 to convert moles of CO2 into grams of CO2. Okay, so now I'm gonna use my coefficients to write my, I'll try to get all the molar masses I need and the molar mole conversion. So they've already done this for you. So to convert, the grams of C2H2 into moles, I have to look up the molar mass. Okay, so I go on the my periodic table and I just combine the mass of the carbons and the hydrogens. So I know carbon is 12, so and then hydrogen is one. So that means I have about 24 grams of carbon in that in a mole, and then around two grams of hydrogen in a mole. So so that ends up being 26.04 grams in all. Okay, so it's just that's just the sum of the ma the masses of all the individual atoms in that formula. That gives me the 26.04 grams per mole. Okay, I look at my mole mole relationship. Well, in this case, I'll, I haven't gotten there yet. Let me. This is showing the relationship of the carbon dioxide. So this is just the molar mass of carbon dioxide, which is 44.01 grams of CO2 per mole. So that's just based upon the sum of the mass of the carbon and the two oxygens. Okay, and that's that's what we did um, back in uh, two lectures ago. Okay, here is again the mole mole. Oh, why is it going? Go forward. Okay, here is the mole mole relationship again. So I see we have two moles of C2H2 for every four moles of carbon dioxide. So it's a two to four relationship. Okay, now it's showing you both versions. Just be aware, if you only write one formula, one relationship down between the two substances, you might have to flip it over depending on which what substance you want to cancel out. Okay, so they're showing you both variations here of the same, the reciprocals of both, formula, uh, both uh, ratios. Okay, so here is where I set up the equation. So this is where the dimensional analysis is critical. So I start with the 4.6 grams of C2H2. Now going back to my plan, my original step was to take that mass of C2H2 and convert it to moles of C2H2. So I'm right there, I'm multiplying it by the molar mass. I put the grams of C2H2 on the bottom and the moles of C2H2 on the top. Okay, so that allows the grams of C2H2 to cancel out. Okay, so that's step one. Okay, is just converting the grams of C2H2 to moles of C2H2. Once we, once we've done that, we have moles of C2H2. So now I'm gonna convert, for step two, I'm gonna take my moles of C2H2, cancel that out, and convert it to moles of carbon dioxide. So that's where the second conversion factor comes in. So I have four moles of CO2 on the top over two moles of CO2 on the bottom. And notice again, the moles of C2H2 now cancel out. So if I stop there, that would I would have the moles of CO2. 
Now the final step is to take the moles of CO2 that I figure out and convert that into grams. So I use the molar mass of carbon dioxide as the final step. So I have 44.01 grams of CO2 over one mole of CO2 and that gives me 185 grams of CO2. Okay, so this is three steps. I convert grams to moles for substance A. I convert moles of substance A into substance B. And I convert the moles of substance B into grams. Okay. And so now I see I have 185 grams of carbon dioxide is produced when 54.6 grams of C2H2 react. And if you look at this carefully, notice everything is canceling out. And in terms of my significant figures, I just look at the significant figures in my starting amount, which is three. My two molar masses, in this case, show four significant figures in each one. And my mole-mole ratio, again, it's exact, so I don't worry about significant figures in that. So then um, I end up rounding it to three significant figures. So that's where it's the 185 comes in. Okay, questions. You can um, you can either at, speak or type them in. How do I get the forty four point oh one? Good question. That is the molar mass of carbon dioxide. So let me go back one slide to show where that was calculated. Okay, so this is the mass of the one carbon atom and the two oxygen atoms. So if you remember, oxygen atoms have a mass of 16. So there's two of them, so that's 32. And then one carbon atom has a mass of 12, approximately. So 32 plus 12 gives me 44. Okay, so I'm just getting, I'm just adding up the masses of all the atoms for that particular formula. And the same thing with the um, C2H2. Okay, the 26.04. I did it the same way, just adding up the mass of the two carbon atoms and the two hydrogen atoms. And, okay, other questions? Okay. You're gonna need, you're gonna have to do a lot of these problems. These are not this again. This is an easy material. You probably have to do. I'll I'll post a bunch of these on it um, with the uh, with the dimensional analysis template so you can work it through. Um, I'll put put a bunch in the practice section so you, you should have enough to keep yourself busy when you're reviewing these. All right. You want to do want to do one more? Or you want me to go on to some new stuff? Okay, another. Okay, let's do another. All right. Looks like every, there's a good consensus. They want we want more problems. All right. So how many grams of N2 gas I need to react with 11 grams of hydrogen to make ammonia? Okay. So we're given grams of hydrogen, and it's asking how many grams of N2 gas are needed to react with the hydrogen. So in this case, they're giving us a reactant. They're asking how much of another reactant we need to combine with it to make ammonia. So I'm asking about, it doesn't ask me how, it doesn't need to know how much ammonia in this case. It just needs to know how much of another product, I'm, I'm sorry, how much of another reactant I'm going to have. So I start out with, start with what I'm given and what I'm trying to figure out. 
So I'm given 11 grams of hydrogen, and I need grams of N2. So I have my balanced equation, and I always suggest just if they get an equation of problem, just make sure it's balanced. In this case, it is. So now I, I decide upon the plan before I go any further. So I start with the grams of H2. My first step is I'm going to convert that into moles of H2. So then I'm going to take the moles of that substance, H2, convert it to what I'm trying to figure out, which is N2. So I go from moles of H2 to moles of N2. And then it's asking how many grams of N2. So I'm going to take the moles of N2 and convert that into grams. Okay. Now eventually you'll get to the point where you might, there's some cases where problems may not give you grams and they'll ask you to convert it to other substances. You might have to convert to a volume or to um, volume. If it's a gas, I might ask for a volume of a gas. So I don't know why am I I'm going too far. There we go. So I want to get all the um, conversion factors I need. So I, I know I have to convert grams of hydrogen gas into moles of hydrogen gas. So I calculate the molar mass of H2. So that's just the total mass of the two hydrogen atoms. So I get 2.02 .02 grams per mole of H2. And I also need the molar mass of N2. So N has an, nitrogen has a mass of 14 times 2 is 28. Okay, so I get the 28.02 grams of N2 per mole. So I, I forget, I forgot to mention this, but remember when you're doing these problems, they're showing not just grams, but the particular substance with it. Okay, because you don't want to, when you're doing the dimensional analysis of these problems, you just don't want to put grams. You want to put grams and the name of the substance, because then otherwise you're going to get your grams mixed up. You, you don't want to confuse grams of one substance with grams of another substance. So always lay, be care, put as much labeling as you need to allow you to solve these problems. Why is it going there? Okay. So now, I have my mole-mole relationship. So I have three moles of H2 per one mole of N2. Well, one mole of N2 per three moles of H2. Again, the mole-mole factor just comes from my balanced equation. One N2 for every three N2. I'm sorry, let me repeat that. 1N2 for every 3H2, which means 1 mole of N2 for every 3 moles of H2. Okay, so then I set up the problem and do the conversion factors. So I'm starting with 11 grams of H2. Okay, that's what I'm given. I already knew my first step was to convert that into moles, so I'm going to use the molar mass. So I have one mole of H2 over 2.02 .02 grams of H2, and my grams of H2 cancel out, and I'm, now I have moles of H2. The second step is to convert moles of H2 into moles of N2. So now I have one mole of N2 over three moles of H2. Okay, that's my mole conversion. Now, if, you, if you're not sure which way the equation goes, just look at your dimensional analysis, make sure they cancel out. Okay, because I have moles of H2 on the top in that second place, I need the moles of H2 on the bottom to cancel out. So I'm going to put the three moles of H2 on the bottom and the one mole of N2 on the top. Okay. And again, I'm just making sure everything cancels out. And then the third step is to take the moles of N2 and convert that into grams. So I have 
I use the molar mass of N2. So I have 28.02 grams of N2 over one mole of O2. I'm sorry, one mole of N2. And then, again, I just look at it, make sure everything cancels out, the grams of H2 canceling out, moles of H2 cancel out, and moles of N2 cancel out. So uh, my, I have what I expect. My, my units make sense. And then if I'm doing this in a calculator, I would do 11 divided by 2.02 .02 divided by 3 times 28.02. Okay. Um, and I get 50.9. I would suggest um, when you're doing these, just try to estimate them. And you had, especially on a test, have an idea of what I, you expect to get for your problem. So in this case, I would say um, 11 over 2, that's approximately 5, all right? And then 5 over 3, that might be around 5 over 3 is about between 1 and 2, okay? So something between 1 and 2 times 28. This is, I would say, okay, if I take 28 and multiply it by some value between 1 and 2, this is 50, a reasonable answer. And I would say yes. Okay. If I did in the calculator and I get like 5 million or 0 0.008 for an answer, I'd, know, I'd say, okay, wait, I got to double check. I must have hit divided instead of multiply or fat fingered a number. So always always have a general sense of what, what you expect for an answer. It doesn't have to be exact. You just want to have a ballpark idea in your head so when you're not shocked when the number comes out of your calculator. And you don't want to just trust what the number that comes out of your calculator is the truth. You want to, because it's very easy to fat finger a number or when you're putting these in. Okay. Um, is this starting to make sense? A little, yes. Okay. Okay, the conversions, yes. If you understand the conversions, um, Is that a happy or a, is that a shocked face? Okay. Exploding face, okay. Um, yeah, so d definitely we can, we'll, we'll definitely, if I don't expect everyone to, to understand this fully tonight. But if you're starting to get a general sense, then when you review it again later on this week, and if you, again, you can make, set up a time with me and I can, we can review some more practice problems as we can always do that. And I'll, um, and I think after you work through the problems on the homework, it will we'll start to make more sense. But it, it's gonna, it's might be a little painful to the first few times you're trying to figure these out. Just gotta work through the pain and you'll it'll, you'll eventually get it. It just it it's just it's it's challenging material. Okay. You want to do one more, or do we want to go on? Um, we got around an hour tonight, so I can do another problem. And if we need more time, I can always we can always set up a session next week or the, later in the week. Okay, one more, please. All right. Move on. All right. So I say move on. One more. I'll do this. I'll go quickly through this. I won't. I won't go as long for this problem, but I'll, I'll just do it quickly. Okay. How many grams of potassium are required to produce 36.0 grams of potassium chloride? So again, I start with my balanced equation. I'm given grams of potassium chloride. I'm trying to figure out how many grams of potassium I need. And my next step is to get the conversion factors. Okay, I guess my next step is to set up the plan. So I start with grams of potassium chloride, convert to moles of potassium chloride, 
and then I'm trying to figure out potassium. So I convert the moles of potassium chloride to moles of potassium, and then I convert it into grams. So you see from all these problems, it doesn't matter if they're starting you with a reactant or product. The conversion factors are all going to be set up the same way. It doesn't matter if you're starting with a reactant or a product. Okay, you, you just pull the parts of the equation that you need to solve the problem when you're setting up that mole-mole conversion. So once I have my plan, I, I just calculate the molar masses for the substances I need. So there's the molar mass of potassium chloride and molar mass of potassium, which is just from the periodic table. And then I look at my mole-mole ratio. So I have two moles of potassium chloride for every two moles of potassium. So it's a two to two ratio again. And then here's my molar mass of potassium. And then I just, following my plan, I set it up. So I have 36 grams of potassium chloride. I convert that into moles. So I have one mole of potassium chloride over 74.55 grams of potassium chloride. Again, that's the molar mass. I take the moles of potassium chloride and convert it to moles of potassium. So two moles of potassium for every two moles of potassium chloride. And then the last step, I convert that into grams. So 39.1 grams of potassium for every one mole of potassium. So just solve this out, do this out. So um, again, if I'm doing this in my head, 3 over 74 is approximately one half. 36 over 74 is about one half. Okay, because 36 times 2 is 72, so it's about 36 over 74 is approximately one half. And one half of 39 is about 20. So I would expect my answer to be around 20. So, 36, I, so I do 36.0 divided by 74.55. Um, 2 over 2 is 1, so I just I, I'll skip that. And then times 39.1, and I get 18.9, which is about 20. So I'm, I'm going to trust if my calculator said that. And then I round it. If it wasn't rounded, I want to make sure I round it to the proper number of significant figures. So um, looking at this, the 36.0 has three significant figures, and both of my molar masses have four, and the mole-mole ratio is exact. So I can't have more than three significant figures in my answer because that's the fewest. So I round uh, whatever I get to three significant figures, which according to this is 18.9. Okay. So th those are so those are problems where um, we're converting mass of one substance into a mass of another substance. Now, sometimes you might be given a problem where you have multiple reactants, but they don't tell you which substance gets used up first. And it can, with a reaction, we have when the substance that gets used up first in a reaction is called a limiting reagent or a limiting reactant. So for example, if I have a wood in a fire, okay, I'm burning a log in a fireplace. If I'm, if it's exposed to the air, then I can pretty much assume I have an unlimited supply of oxygen. And, but I have a limited supply of wood because I only have the log. So once the log is burned, the reaction will stop. Now, in another case, if I have a candle that's burning, and I ha put a, um, a bell snuffer over it to snuff out the candle, what that does is it cuts off the oxygen supply. So once the oxygen supply under that bell is used up, the reaction stops. Even though there's plenty more candle to burn, there's no oxygen available, the reaction to stop. So in that case, oxygen becomes the limiting reactant. So here's, here's some more concrete examples. So again, a limiting reactant is this part of a chemical reaction that runs out first. 
And once that runs out, that stops the reaction. And it's the amount of the limiting reactant that determines the amount of product that can form. Because once that limiting reactant used up, I'm done. The reaction can't continue, and I'm, I have all the product that I can create. So here's a little more, a little more of a simpler example. So let's say I have a table setting. And from a table setting, I, can, I need one fork, one knife, and one spoon. So if I have six forks, four spoons, and seven knives, which utensil is going to get used up first? Spoons, correct. So if spoons gets used up first, how many ta table settings can I make from this setup? Four. So that's the idea of a limiting reagent, is I have different amounts of different reactants, but whatever one gets used up first, that's going to determine which reactant I can have and which, which product, how much product I can make. So our chemical equation, you can't usually do it in your head like this, but I'm going to I'm going I'm going to go through an algorithm and uh, with this problem and then you can see how it will apply to a chemical reaction. So let's just say if I had six forks and I'm not worrying about my other substances, how many table settings can I make? If I have six, right. If I have six and an unlimited amount of every other reactant, I can make six settings. Now we also we said from four spoons I can make four settings from the four spoons, and then from seven knives, I can make how many table settings? Seven. So I look at the all the possible sets of table settings. I can make six from the forks, four from the spoons, and seven from the knives. Whatever amount produces the smaller amount of the quote, product, unquote, that's my limiting reagent. So in this case, you obviously can do it in your head. So I'm, I'm basically calculating in, from each reactant how much of a product I can make. And whatever ends up being the smaller, that's my limiting reagent. That's what's going to limit my reaction. OK. So here's just a showing that example again for each of my initial ones how much I used and it's showing you when I use the four spoons the reaction stops so I have four table settings but then I do have forks and knives left over that didn't react okay so here's another example how many peanut butter sandwiches can be made from eight slices of bread and one jar of peanut butter. Four. Okay. Correct. Um, unless you really like peanut butter and use a whole jar on one sandwich, but I would, I would hate to think of the calories in that. But um, we're assuming we're assuming we use about a tablespoon, and you have a full jar of peanut butter. So we're going to assume. Our bread is our limiting reagent, and we can make four peanut butter sandwiches. Um, so they, we, moral of the story is, even with this, you want to know what the ratio. So we're assuming we use about a tablespoon of peanut butter, and you have we know we have probably a plenty of tablespoons in a full jar of peanut butter. Okay, so in that case, our bread is a limiting reagent and we can make four slices. So in a second case, we only have one tablespoon of peanut butter and eight slices of bread. So according to this, we can make one measly peanut butter sandwich and we have six slices of bread left over. 
So again, in this case, our limiting rea reagent or reactant is the peanut butter. And that limits how many sandwiches we can make. Okay. So let's apply this to a problem. Now we'll, for these problems, you're gonna, you're pretty much gonna do what you, we've already done in the previous types of problems, except we have to do twice the number of calculations because for each reactant, we have to figure out how much of a product we can get from that reactant. And then whatever one ends up being smaller, that will be our, determine our limiting reagent. Now, I've, some books will also say you can use, you can figure out, you can look at one reactant and figure out how much of another reactant will, it will combine with. And then from that, you can determine if you have enough for the second reactant or it's going to be left over. That, that's another valid way to solve it. I kind of find on a test when you're stressed out, this is a little, this is kind of an easy way to solve it. Um, it's not really, both ways you're doing the same amount of work, but this, I think with this, you just figure out how much product you need and you take the smaller one. I think it's easy to explain and when you're on a test, it's easy to kind of think about. So, again, we want to state the given and needed amount of the substance. We write out our plan. We use our mole mole factor for the equation. And we calculate the moles of the product, or sometimes if we need grams, the grams of the product from each reactant, and select a smaller amount with, as our limiting reactant. Okay. Now, some, for some of these problems, they might start you with grams, but in this case, they're being nice, so they're going to start you with moles. So, four moles of H2 and two moles of chlorine are mixed. How many moles of HCl can we make? Okay, so we state what we're given. Four moles of H2 and C, two moles of HCl2. So, what we need is how many moles of HCl we create and our limiting reactant. Okay. So we're going to set up, we're going to do the setup. We're going to do this twice. We're first going to figure out how many moles of HCl we can make from four moles of H2, and then how many moles of HCl we can make from the two moles of Cl2. And whatever one ends up producing the smaller amount, that gives us our limiting reactant, and that gives us the amount of product we can make. Okay. So we're gonna we have two sets of equations. We have to figure out the HCl from the H2 and the HCl from the Cl2. In both cases, we're using a mole-mole factor. So I don't have to worry about molar masses here because they, we already we're at moles. We don't have to do any mole to grams conversions. So I just look at the the ratios from the equation. So I need one ratio of H2 to HCl, and I see I have one mole of H2 for every two moles of HCl. Okay, and you might need a reciprocal, so I show you two versions. And then the second relationship is the relationship between Cl2 and HCl. So I have one mole of Cl2 for every two moles of HCl. So I have that. And so I set this up and I have two equations to solve. So I'm going to calculate the moles of product from each reactant and select a smaller number of moles as the amount of product formed from the limiting reactant. So I start with four moles of H2. I have my conversion factor, two moles of HCl for every one mole of H2. Again, the H2s cancel out, and I get eight moles of HCl. Okay, then I look at the second equation. I start with two moles of Cl2, and I use that conversion factor, and I have two moles of HCl for every one mole of Cl2. 
and that one produces only four moles of HCl. Okay, so I look at the two values and I take the smaller, okay, which is a four moles of HCl because that's the um, that's the most I can make because at that point I'm out of Cl2 and is so there's going to be H2 left over. So the smaller number is the amount of product I can get, which is four moles of HCl, and my limiting reactant is going to be the chlorine because that's the one that produces a smaller amount of product. Okay. Questions on this? Okay. No questions. Okay. So here's a little. Now, sometimes they may give you the problem in grams. Um, you got to basically do the similar setup. Now, when you're given grams, you you don't have to do two whole sets of equations because you can. But I'll I'll, sh I'll I'll start with this algorithm, then I'll show you a couple shortcuts you can do to kind of if you need to limit some steps in a few places. So what they start is you you given a certain amount of grams, and they ask you how many grams of a product we can make. So we're pretty much going to take the similar approach we did in the previous problem, except now we're going to we need to add the conversion to and from grams of each substance. So we're really just we're treating this like a the other grams to mole to grams problems, except we have to do it twice for each reactant. So we in this case. So we have in a catalytic converter that's um, in cars that um, kind of limit the amount of pollution in your mufflers. So we have carbon monoxide reacts to form carbon dioxide and nitrogen gas. So I start with 16 grams of nitrogen monoxide and it combines with 12 grams of carbon monoxide. How many grams of CO2 can be produced? So it doesn't tell us how limiting reactant here. It gives us two different substances that are reactants, and it asks us to figure out what's the amount of carbon dioxide can be produced. So we stay, start with the given amount of each substance. So we're given 16 grams of nitrogen monoxide and 12 grams of carbon monoxide. We have to figure out how many grams of carbon dioxide we can get from this. So, we want to do a conversion. Now, we have to do everything twice. Now, technically, you, you might say, well, I, I can, once I'm, I know how many moles of two, I can just take the smaller number of moles of that and then just only have to do one of those steps into grams, which is true. If you want to just convert both things into moles and then take the smaller number of moles and convert that into grams, you can do that. Or you can just convert everything from grams to grams and take the smaller number of grams. Either way, it's going to work. Um, so here, okay, we start with the grams of substance A. So our first reactant is nitrogen monoxide. We convert that into moles of nitrogen monoxide. We convert that into moles of carbon dioxide, and then we convert that into grams. And we do the same thing for the grams of carbon monoxide, a second reactant. We take the grams of carbon monoxide, convert that into moles of carbon monoxide, convert the moles of carbon monoxide, con carbon dioxide, and convert it into grams of carbon dioxide. Okay. And just like in the previous problem, we look at our two grams of, from each reactant, and the smaller one is going to be the amount of product we can make. And 
the substance that produced the smaller amount of product as our limiting reactant. So I set up all my conversion factors I need. So I have to calculate the mass of nitrogen monoxide. So that's 30.01. Again, we, we know how to do molar masses. It's just the sum of all the masses of the atoms. I need the mass of carbon monoxide. So I do that. And then I need the mass of carbon dioxide. So there's a 44.01. So I have all those calculated. Next, I have to get my mole-mole conversions. So I, I have to convert nitrogen monoxide to carbon dioxide. And um, so this is my relationship, two moles of NO over two moles of CO2. And then I also have to convert carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. So I have two moles of carbon monoxide for every two moles of carbon dioxide. And that's a typo. They should have put two moles of CO2 over two moles of NO. But OK, so now we have all our conversion factors. So we've got to do two sets of problems. So first one, I take the 16 grams of NO convert that into moles, so one mole of NO over 30.01 grams of NO. I convert the NO to CO2. Two moles of CO2 over two moles of NO. And then I convert the CO2 into grams, so times 44.0 grams of CO2 over one mole of CO2. And I just double check, make sure everything cancels out. And um, if I'm doing this in my head, I'd saying, okay, I would say like 16 over 30 is about one half, and then I'm multiplying one half times one, and then one half times 44. So I expect to be something around half of 44 is my answer. So something around 22 I would expect, and I do the calculation, I get 23.5. So I figure, okay, that's that makes sense for that calculation. So then I do the same thing on the bottom, but I'm just starting with the grams of carbon monoxide now. Um, grams of carbon monoxide, I convert that into moles of carbon monoxide. And then I convert the moles of carbon monoxide to the moles of carbon dioxide. And then I convert the moles of carbon dioxide into grams of carbon dioxide. Okay. So I'm kind of going through this fast because we've gone through these plenty of times already. Um, so again, I look at the, just do it in my head, okay, 12 over 28, that's a little less than half. And again, I'm times one, so I have 44.01 times something that's a little less than half. So I expect <clears throat> something around 20 for my substance, and I get 18.9, so I would say, okay, that makes sense. So I look at my two products, and I take the smaller number. So in this case, the smaller number is the 18.9. So that's the maximum amount of product I can get, and my limiting reactant is 12.0. Now, if you ever come across a problem where you might have three or four reactants, you got to do it three or four times. I'm not going to give you three or four reactants on a test, but I'm just saying if it's like you're in an experiment and you have multiple substances and you have to figure out, you have to, you have to do it for each reactant you have. Um, in that case. All right, so going on to the next step. You want to do another one or you want to go on? It's about nine, almost 9.30. Go on, OK. I think, I mean, you can see it's a lot of the same stuff. So once you know the mole-mole conversions, it gets very repetitive. I know if you're doing a limiting reagent, it's the same work. It's just a lot more of it you have to do. Um, sometimes if you're doing these on, if you're doing these at home, sometimes Excel helps when you're doing long calculations like this. If you know how to use Excel, do because you can put the numbers in a spreadsheet and it'll do the calculation for you. Um, all right, so let's go on then. I'm not going to skip these. I think we all have a good idea. If you need to review them. All 
Okay. Last thing I want to talk about tonight is percent yield. Now, percent yield is given the amount of a product, determine the percent yield for a reaction. So, percent yield is based upon if you actually do the experiment in a laboratory, how much of the product do you get compared to what in theory you can get? So what we've been doing up to this point is called theoretical yield. It's based upon our theoretical model of the chemical equation, which is a very simple model. It's just based upon that balanced equation and using that model, which is just a theoretical model, it determines how much of a product we can get based upon the reactant. Now, that is a very simple model. It doesn't take into consideration um, how the skill of the experiment or how well they're doing the measurements, doesn't take into account the quality of our equipment, doesn't take into account the environment our reaction is going under, the temperature of the day, there's all these other variables that can affect the reaction and how well it occurs. Like how well you mix the reactants together can affect it. All these other variables can affect if the reaction goes to completion or not. Okay. Um, very often, just think of an example of a log in a fireplace. It's, it's common that when you have a log burning in the fireplace, it's possible the fire can go out before the log is finished, uh, before all the wood, wood is burned. Okay, you might find after, after the fire goes out, there might be some wood that just didn't get close enough to the flame for it to react. So theoretical yield is based just upon the theoretical model that we have to do our calculation. Okay, good example, if you think about um, when the, for the coronavirus, you see, if you look at all these graphs, that they're using these computer models based upon what we know at the time and how much they estimate for, in terms of how many people they can get sick based upon looking at other countries and their reaction rates. And that we've made those estimates based upon our modeling, a computer model of the infection rates for the coronavirus. Now, we actually don't know how much, how many people are going to get sick, the death rate, or the number of hospital beds and we need until that we actually hit the, that point in the cycle and we actually see, okay, how many doctor, how many people actually get infected. So the calculation rate of what we estimate is our theoretical model. And the actual model is what actually happens once we hit that date in the cycle. That's a, that's a similar scenario here. Okay, the theoretical yield is based upon our model of the reaction, which is our, just our chemical equation. And the actual yield is what we would get when the re reaction actually takes place. So we run the experiment in the lab. Now, we don't have a... We're not, we're not doing any experiments in the lab. So for these problems, they're going to just tell you what the actual yield is in the problem. Um, if, if you were taking a lab course, that would be you'd run the experiment and you'd measure the amount of product you can get. So then the percent yield looks at the relationship between the actual yield over the theoretical yield. Now, the Actual yield can never be greater than the theoretical yield because that would violate the law of conservation of matter. Okay, but it can be less than it because not all of the reactants may react, or you might lose some of the product in the process when you're collecting it. So it's possible the actual yield can be small. Will most of the time be less than the theoretical yield. In fact. According to some of the laws of thermal dynamics, the, the actual yield can never be 100%. It's, according to the laws of thermal dynamics, it's actually impossible because it would, you can, you'd never create a, have a perfect reaction. So 
there, there's that yield. So here's just an example. Okay, on the space shuttle, we they use lithium hydroxide to remove carbon dioxide from the air. Remember in Apollo 13, um, they they call these CO2 scrubbers when the astronauts are in space, they exhale CO2, but if the, if the CO2 levels get too high, that can become toxic. So they have these scrubbers which contain a substance that can absorb the CO2 from the air and convert it into a solid product. So that's what we have here. Okay, we have lithium hydroxide solids. It's exposed to CO2 in the air and it forms a lithium bicarbonate. So we're going to see the percent yield. So it's asking, what is the percent yield if 50 grams of lithium bi hydroxide produces 72.8 grams of lithium bicarbonate? So what we, we have to figure out what we need and what we're given. Now we're given the amount of reactant, 50.0 grams of lithium hydroxide, and we're given our actual yield of the lithium bicarbonate, 72.8. This is what we get in the laboratory. So what we need is our theoretical yield. We have to calculate that. And then once we have the theoretical yield, we're going to get the percent yield. So this part, the first step, we have to calculate the theoretical yield, which this is what we've been doing the past few problems. So I'm not, I'm going to, not going to go into detail on that, but it's the same steps we've been doing. Take the grams of lithium bihydroxide, convert it into moles, convert moles of first substance into moles of second substance, and convert that into grams. Okay. Oh, before I go on, and then once we have that calculated yield of lithium bicarbonate, that is our theoretical yield. Okay, the, again, theoretical yield is based upon a model that we calculate. Actual yield, you actually do the experiment in the laboratory. In this case, they, they did it in the laboratory and they told you the amount. So we have an actual yield and we've calculated the theoretical yield. Now, to get the percent, we take the ratio of the actual yield over the theoretical yield and then convert that into a percentage. So, okay. So the first steps, we're doing the same conversion, calculation of the theoretical yield that we've done for all the previous problems. We get the molar masses of both substances. We get the mole-mole ratio, okay? So in this case, they only get, we don't have to worry about limiting reagent because they gave us the, our they, we know what our limiting reagent is it's a lithium bicarbonate so um, we we do the conversions we convert the grams of lithium hydroxide to moles then the, into moles of lithium bicarbonate and then back into grams so I look at this in my head I'm saying okay 50 over 23 is about two and then times one and then 67 times two is around 140 I would say okay so I just do the calculation in my calculator, 50 divided by 23.95 times 1 times 67.96, I get 142. Okay. And I round it to three significant figures, so there's my results. So this is my theoretical yield. My actual yield was given to us. So I just use the theoretical yield formula now. I take 72.8 grams of lithium bicarbonate over 142, which is my theoretical yield, and turns out it's about, my yield is about 51.3%. So it's about half of what I could get in theory. Okay. Questions on this? Okay, good.
Okay. So, here's just another equation. Without proper ventilation and limited oxygen, the reaction of carbon and oxygen produces carbon monoxide. So based on just on the wording of the problem, they're telling you oxygen is your limiting reagent because they say it's limited. So here it's asking, what is the percent yield if 40 grams of carbon monoxide is produced when 30 grams of oxygen is used? So in this case, they give us our theoretical yield, which is a 40 gram. I'm sorry, they give us our actual yield, 40 grams. That's what we would get if we performed this in a laboratory. And we have to figure out our percent yield. So in order to get our percent yield, again, we have to calculate the theoretical yield and then use the percent yield formula. OK, so figure out what I need and what I'm given. So I'm given the mass of 30 grams of oxygen, and I'm given my actual yield of product, which is 40 grams of carbon monoxide. So I need to figure out the theoretical yield and the percent yield. All right. So I write out the plan to calculate my theoretical and percent yield. So the percent yield is just the actual yield over the theoretical yield of my product. And I multiply that by 100 to change it into a percent. And then the theoretical yield calculation is just converting, again, the grams of the first substance into moles and to moles of the second substance back into grams. So we've done this so many times. So next, I want to get gather all the conversion factors I need. So I need, I need to convert grams of oxygen into moles. So I know I need the molar mass of O2. So O2 is 16 times 2. OK, I'm using the molar mass of O2, not oxygen atoms, but two oxygen atoms. So one mole of O2 has a mass of 32 grams of O2. Okay. A lot of times I see people just use one mole of O over 16 grams of O, but you want O2 because that's the, the formula of the substance in the reactions. So one mole of O2 over 32 grams of O2. Set next, I need grams of carbon monoxide. So I, I'm going to have to convert grams of carbon monoxide from Car moles of carbon monoxide. So I use figure out the molar mass of carbon monoxide, 28.01. And there's a typo. That should say 28.01 grams of CO, not C. And then the second part's correct. All right, then I just I need my mole mole conversion factors. So I look at this equation. I see there's one O2 for every two COs. So my conversion factor will be one mole of O2 over two moles of CO. And again, I can flip it either way. All right. Then I just calculate my theoretical yield first. So I start with the amount of my reactant, 30 grams of O2. This is my limiting reactant. So I convert that into moles. So I have one mole of O2 over 32 grams of O2. And then I convert the O2 into CO. So times two moles of CO over one mole of O2. And then I convert the CO into grams. So 28 grams of CO over one mole of CO. So again, if I think it through in my head, 30 over 32 is about 1. 1 times 2 is 2. And then 2 times 28 is around a little more than 50. OK. So in my calc, I do 30 divided by 32 times 2 times 28. 
and then I round it to three sig figs, so that gives me 52.5 grams of CO. And again, doing this on paper, you make sure everything cancels out, and in this case it does. So now 52.5 grams of CO is my theoretical yield. So then, for my theoretical yield, I can calculate my percent yield. So I know from this reaction, I actually my actual yield is 40 grams. I divide it by 52.5, my theoretical yield, and then multiply it by 100%. So 40 over 52.5 times 100, and it gives us a percent yield of 76.2. Okay. Okay, questions. No, that was kind of the same. Okay, just one little thing I'm going to add on tonight. It's just a short little, it's only a few more slides left. So I just want to, another part when you look at analyzing equations is you might want to look at the energy in a reaction. So when we talk about energy in a reaction that we refer to that as enthalpy which is the amount of heat that's either absorbed or released in a reaction okay so most cases most reactions are going to involve the loss or gain of energy Okay, and energy is just, we call it the ability to do work. Energy can be in the form of heat, light, um, it could be electrical energy, it could be um, even sound is a form of energy, okay? So, in this case, we're going to be looking at mostly energy in the form of heat being absorbed or released. So, usually the SI, the System International Unit for Measuring Energy, and it just happens to also be the same unit we use to measure work, is a joule. So, joules, now you'll also see, another, there's another unit of energy um, you might see in reactions is calorie, okay. Calorie and joules are both units of energy. You can you can solve problems calculating energy in either calories or joules. Um, usually, when you're dealing with food, you usually all often obviously see calories, but um, they're both units of energy. So you could actually calculate um the amount of energy in food and in terms of joules instead of calories it's they're just different units it's just like inches and centimeters both measure length okay so when we talk about the heat or enthalpy change of the reaction this is the amount of heat absorbed or released that occurs when the reaction is done at constant pressure okay that's uh, we say constant pressure because if the pressure changes then that indicates some of that energy is being d converted into into the pressure change and we, if we want to analyze the heat change in a reaction we have to do it under constant pressure so the energy just gets converted into heat if we're converting the energy if the energy is used to change the pressure, then we're losing some of that heat change and it's going into another area. So we always, when we talk about heat of a reaction, we always do it under constant pressure conditions. So, in a exothermic reaction, so this is a reaction that releases heat. So, for example, if you're burning a log in a fireplace, heat's being released. So that's considered an exothermic reaction. So in a case like that, because 
he is being released from the scenario or the, from the from the reaction standpoint we consider the delta h negative okay because he is being lost to the environment and they say okay well i'm near a fire i'm getting warm yes you're taking the heat but the fire is losing the heat the fire is giving off the heat so it's losing energy when be when you're in the fire and you're getting warm you're gain you're taking the energy so that's why we, from an exothermic reaction, we consider the heat change negative. So in this case, the, if the delta H is negative, which means we losing 185 kilojoules for every mole that's reacted, that indicates an exothermic reaction. Okay. And here's an example. So if the reactants have a certain amount of energy when they're starting, if the products have less energy, that's an example. Heat is being released to the environment. It's an exothermic reaction. Now, some reactions absorb heat. Now, if you have a cold pack, okay, you, you, you injure yourself, and you're swelling, and you may have a cold pack. Well, if you um, break a pack and you put it and you if you put it on your skin it feels cold that's an example of an endothermic reaction okay um endothermic reactions do not have to be chemical reactions they can be a physical change too so if you put ice on an injury okay well there's a physical change of the ice churning into water when you put ice on a uh, on your like let's say you sprain your ankle and you put ice on it to reduce the swelling the act of ice melting is an endothermic reaction it's absorbing heat from the surroundings which is why you feel cold it's taking the heat from your body and using it to drive the physical change of converting solid ice into liquid water now that is only a physical change but it's still endothermic Okay, it's absorbing energy. Now here's an example. N2, an O2 is a chemical reaction, but it's also endothermic, okay? It's absorbing heat from the surroundings as it, as it drives the reaction forward. Okay, so in this case, the energy of the products is greater than the energy of the reactants. Okay, so to sum up, for an endothermic reaction, we're absorbing heat from the environment, so the delta H is positive. For an exothermic reaction, we're releasing heat to the environment, so the delta H is negative, because heat is going out of the reaction into the environment. Um, I think I will... I'll just do one example now. We'll, we'll do this slide and we'll end it here. So if you look at the top reaction, N2 plus 3H2 yields 2NH3 and 92 kilojoules of heat. Is that exo or endothermic? I see endo. Anyone else? Let's say endo. Okay, let's go back to endo indicates heat is absorbed and the heat is on the reactant side. Here the heat is on the product side. So this means heat is being produced. It's escaping. That's exothermic. Okay. So heat is coming out of the reaction into the environment. This is like an example with the fire burning. That's exo. So here's a reaction now. The second case, we have calcium carbonate is decomposing into 
calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. So here, this is endo because the heat is going into the reaction. It's taking the heat from the environment and pushing the reaction forward. So in this case, this is would end up feeling, feeling cold, OK? Because it's absorbing heat. This is, this is like the ice melting, OK? Ice is absorbing heat as it melts. That's why when you hold it, it feels cold. It's taking, it's taking the heat out of your hand as it melts. OK, the last example. OK, we have, it doesn't tell you how much heat, but we, it says that heat's being released. So this is, again, exothermic. Heat is a product. OK. Um, let's, I think we'll end it here. That's about 10 of. OK, so next, if you, again, if you want to um, ping me this week, just send me an email if you want to set up a session to just review some of the homework problems if you're still having trouble with the conversions. I did post, um, if you're having trouble with the writing the formulas from the names, I did post a few practice problems on that. Um, and um, I also posted the homework for this week on this. So just check the due dates on the assignments. Um, so if you haven't done, if you haven't submitted this week's homework, just make sure you log in and do it. I think I gave, I set the due date for tomorrow. So you have so any time, so just make sure you get it submitted for this week's homework by tomorrow. I'm, I mean, last week's homework submitted by tomorrow. Um, homework that I put on tonight, you have until next week to do. So, um, and then next Tuesday, I will just treat it as a review session, and then um, I'll just answer questions, review stuff, and then. Um, that after that after Tuesday I'll, I'll post the exams and um, then and it'll be in two different blocks so then just have to complete both sets of questions and then submit them um, yeah if I will what I'll do this week with the homework is um what if you submitted the assignments I just I'm going to give me a day or so just to calculate and put update the homework in on the grade sheet. And then just um, if you look in the after, probably after tomorrow, just check in on the on your uh, on Blackboard and just see if you're missing anything. Because I should I should be up to date as of uh, tomorrow for the homeworks. Um, again, I, I Put more practice problems if you need extra help. Those are optional. I would obviously I'd suggest do as many problems as you can, particularly for these tests. So you make sure you have a good understanding of the material. Um, I think that's it. Um, so um, yeah. So any any other questions concerning the exam? Okay. Um, all right, so um, call it a night. Um, and yeah, if you just if you need me to review stuff, um, just ping me during the week, and we can set up a sign in the regular in the regular classroom, regular virtual classroom. And yeah, we'll go over some stuff. And I'll um, I, uh, tonight I'm I'm gonna start. I'll turn off the recording once we I finish, and then it takes about probably usually within a couple hours because once I stop the recording it has the system has to convert it to a file and upload it so give give it a few hours and then you should be able to have access to this lecture on from the uh, site and I'll also um, post it on the queue manually post it on the queues just to make it a little easier to get to okay so uh, have a good night everyone and I will see you at least next week at the latest if not if I don't see you during any review sessions this week. Okay, have a good night.